Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Naji. I serve as the Director of Education here at Johns Hopkins University in our School of Medicine for our Biomedical Informatics and Data Science Training Program. Uh, welcome today for our, our virtual Grand Rounds in Biomedical Informatics and Data Science. It is uh, truly my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today is Dr. Jayshree Kalpathy Kramer. Uh, she is the chief of the Division of Artificial and Medical Intelligence and an endowed chair in data sciences in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Colorado. Previously, she was an associate professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School. Uh, she was actively involved in data science and AI activities with a focus on medical imaging, with her research spanning the spectrum of novel algorithm development to clinical deployment. Uh, covering the areas of radiology, oncology, and ophthalmology. Uh, Dr. Kapathy Kramer, Kramer has authored over 200 peer-reviewed publications and has written over a dozen book chapters. Uh, I, I'm especially excited to have her here today because I also was trained as a medical imaging informaticist, so it's great to have another one. And her pioneering work on how we can start using federated learning uh, I think is really going to be the future for how we can really create evidence at scale in medicine uh, with while maintaining patient privacy. Uh, Dr. Kilpathy Kramer, thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much for the invitation. And yes, as, as a uh, as someone who has gone through an informatics training program, I've always looked up uh, to Paul and really he's sort of a hero in the field. So thank you again for having me here. Cool. So uh, as was mentioned, I am now in the Department of uh, Ophthalmology, but our work uh, over the last decade or more has been across many uh, clinical domains from uh, radiology, oncology. And so today I, I will talk about some of the work we've done in this area and really sort of uh, motivate why we are excited about uh, federated learning, why we think there's such a need for it, and then walk through some examples of how we did it uh, sort of for real and some of the challenges and some of the um, opportunities there. So my disclosures as mentioned, uh, so here are the objectives sort of lo looking at ex examples from radiology, ophthalmology, oncology, and then really uh, focusing in on challenges around generalizability. So my, my first uh, clinical use case is in a disease uh, called retinopathy of prematurity. This is a disease that affects uh, low birth weight babies, uh, essentially babies before uh, born uh, earlier than 20, 31 weeks of gestation or under 1250 grams. Although uh, in different parts of the world, these uh, the, this criteria may be slightly different. It is a leading cause of preventable uh, childhood blindness worldwide, and it has huge economic and Im other impacts both in the U.S. and globally. The, uh, there are a wide range of treatment options available if diagnosed early, but in many, many parts of the world, there's not enough access to uh, pediatric ophthalmologists, uh, especially globally. So this consortium has been around for more than a decade now, led by Dr. Michael Chang uh, when he was at OHSU. He's now the director of the NEI uh, and a number of collaborators from OHSU in, in Boston as well and, and Chicago. So what we are hoping to do here is essentially use screening to for diagnosis, for disease monitoring, for risk prediction, and so on. The reason we are uh, think there's a lot of value here is that as in many diseases, uh, there is a lot of subjectivity in diagnosis. So uh, if you ask a different set of clinicians as to whether this, based on an image, whether this is uh, sort of advanced disease or moderate or mild, the, those boundaries can be quite fuzzy. And what one person calls mild, another person might call severe and so on. So this, we, we've uh, shown many times in not just ROP, but in many different diseases, that if you do these sort of interator studies, you'll see a lot of variability. So our goal is to see if we can use AI to sort of reduce the um, subjectivity and get an algorithm that's more like the consensus. The exams are stressful. So these are teeny, teeny little babies and they're, they have to be, uh, they're poked and prodded for this exam. And if for instance, we can essentially guarantee that the baby is unlikely to develop disease, uh, we can certainly reduce the frequency of these uh, examinations, which is quite, quite stressful. 
in many, many parts of the world, uh, in places like India and um, other low and middle income countries, there's a severe lack of uh, pediatric ophthalmologists. And again, hopefully AI can help in these situations. Uh, an interesting aspect of what we've seen is actually being able to do things like uh, system level quality assessment. So looking at objective measures of disease severity and seeing how that varies across hospitals, across hospital systems, and also helping sort of looking at the disease in different parts of the world. Does a disease look the same whether when it's in India versus in the US? Or, uh, so both for outcomes research, epidemiological questions, as well as more uh, biological questions, we found some value in these kind of approaches. So the disease is uh, essentially looked at, uh, di diagnosed by looking at the back of your eye. Um, as, the, as the vessels get more tortuous, going from left to right, uh, you can see that the disease severity is increasing. And this is what the goal is to sort of diagnose. So a few years ago, we showed that we can do this and do it relatively well. We can diagnose it as well or better than a consensus panel uh, when using a consensus panel essentially as a ground truth. Uh, so that's that's one use case, and I'll come back to it in, 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 a, sen in a few minutes and again highlight why we think federated learning can help us there as well. The second use case is cervical cancer. This is a, a large project with NCI. It's a leading cause of uh, uh, morbid morbidity and mortality wor worldwide. Um, most cases are associated with HPV uh, infections, and at least in many parts of the world, the current current standard is uh, visual inspection after the uh, application of acetic acid. We have been working on machine learning algorithms for the analysis of the images of the cervix. And again, in conjunction with HPV testing, we think this can be part of a global screening uh, program. A large, again, large number of people involved in this project from across the uh, NCI and across the globe. Uh, this, the Similar to ROP, again, we see a lot of disparities, uh, both within the US and globally. And I think uh, that screening and uh, related efforts can potentially help mitigate some of that. So the project here is uh, seeking to do uh, this sort of three steps where we first start off with a self-sampled HPV uh, typing. The second step is where we are most uh, 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 working with, which is the using developing algorithms for the diagnosis of these photographs and then uh, in combination with treatment uh, at point of care. There was some early work showing that the ability of deep learning to diagnose based on these photographs is quite high. Uh, and again, uh, seem very, very promising. Other challenge, uh, other opportunities that we work in deep learning include in uh, oncology. So we have a lot of projects in segmentation, classification, like uh, response assessment and so on. Uh, in this particular case, we are developing an algorithm for the uh, assessment of breast density from mammography. So as I think many people here are uh, would be fully appreciative of, and these days with things like chat GPT and language models everywhere, we see that AI is all around us. Uh, this, I mean, I don't think you can open a paper or anything without the word AI popping up. It's getting really, really easy to train AI algorithms today. Uh, chat GPT and other tools like that make it even easier. Essentially, if you have uh, things like annotations, you have data and you throw it all into some kind of an auto ML kind of uh, framework, you can out pops an algorithm. The algorithm can now write your abstract for you. It can sort of <laughs> do a lot of things uh, as we've seen. So it's getting really, really easy to train these algorithms if you have data and annotations. However, it still does, despite all of that progress, it does continue to be a little challenging to create algorithms that are sort of generalizable, robust, uh, unbiased and fair and self-aware and sort of saying, I don't know, they very often are conf confidently wrong. So uh, some of the challenges when we take these algorithms from the from essentially the lab to the uh, real world is that there's a lot of heterogeneity that can happen. 
We have different populations. In the case of fundus photo photographs, the pigmentation can be quite different in different populations. So if you trained an algorithm using data from a particular population um, and then try to apply it elsewhere, it may not work as well. Different camera systems can be quite different. They can be different in their field of view. They can be different in sort of the, the characteristics of the image. Um, but like back in the old days with uh, film cameras, you could tell looking at just the, the, the characteristics as to which camera, which uh, film it was, we have the same sort of uh, differences in uh, qualities that of the image that can come from different cameras that make it readily identifiable, both, both to humans and to the models. Different protocols. So it, we were training uh, and expecting to see mostly fundus photographs. And all of a sudden, we saw something that was a much zoomed out view of the eye. And that did, did sort of mess up our algorithm. Image quality can be a challenge, and the biology of the disease can be quite different in different parts of the world. So all of these uh, reasons of having sort of heterogeneity in your data make it more challenging to train an algorithm in one place and have it work flawlessly in other places. There have been a, not a whole lot of studies that have looked at this sort of external validation and generalization, uh, as well as prospective studies. So this is some work from a couple of years ago. It was a sort of living document as to which studies were multi-site, which were prospective. And uh, I think there's still a lot of opportunities to make sure that these algorithms work well across, across wherever they might be uh, intended to be used. So going back to the cervical cancer case, uh, soon after the, there was a publication that said it was working really well, now the next phase of starting to deploy it in a, uh, in a in sort of global study. And there was, again, they found a lot of different challenges when going from the lab to real life. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of them, which is the external uh, validity or the generalizability of the algorithm. Uh, and the other one that we're going to, again, touch upon very briefly is this, this question of bias. So this is sort of our checklist of challenges when we take an algorithm and try to deploy it in, in real life. The models tend to be brittle. They may not generalize across scanner types and population disease presentation. Uh, surprisingly, I, I'm not going to talk about most of them, but uh, just a brief checklist. Uh, some of, surprisingly, the model predictions are not repeatable, especially uh, at, sort of at the boundary between classes. Uh, many diseases lie on a spectrum, uh, many ratings are on a spectrum, but we tend to think of uh, life being black and white and not sort of appreciating this notion of a gray zone. Uh, calibration. Many binary models are not well calibrated. The models can be over-optimistic or confidently wrong. And what we really want is the model to say, I don't know. There's a lot of silent fa failures where you may have no indication because a model uh, output uh, prediction is quite quite uh, <laughs> uh, definitive, but the model may be wrong. Explainability is something that we've talked about a lot in, in the field. How do we make explainable models? Uh, often we see a lot of overfitting the literature and models can be biased. And I think many of these have been covered, I, I understand, in uh, other talks as well. So I'm going to focus on this notion of brittleness. Uh, this is work from a few years ago that, again, suggested that models don't generalize well and data heterogeneity can lead to poor performance. And, and this can be take many forms. So you might have different prevalence of disease across institutions. You might have different scanner types. And there can be some sort of uh, confounding factors as well. So for instance, when we're looking at breast density, the association between size and density in different populations was quite different. Uh, when you have different scanner types, you see sort of, uh, if you just looked at a histogram of intensity of the data coming from different scanners, this was from a, a large study that using the DMIST trial data, where different mammography systems were used. We see the histograms look quite different. And if you train and test on the same scanner, as you see on the diagonal elements, you get good performance. But when you uh, train on one system and test on a different system, you see substantially uh, decreased performance. And this is what was surprising to us uh, is that the models tend to learn the scanner first and then pathology. So we had hoped that a lot of these uh, the early layers of these deep learning models during the normalization process would actually sort of 
account for these difference in variability between scanner types and scanner characteristics. But what we found is that even though we have a really well-performing model, it first learns the uh, the scanner and then within the scanner type looks, learns pathology. So this is what is known as a UMAP, which is a essentially a low dimensional representation of the features that the deep learning model has learned. And you only plot them essentially on a two dimensional space. You can see that if the each cluster, which is on the left color coded by scanner type, it was quite distinct. But within the scanner type on the right, you see that going from fatty to dense uh, breast density, which is what we were estimating here. It has learned that pathology quite well, uh, but it is again within the scanner type. So the problem with this now is if you bring in a fourth different scanner type, it'll have a different cluster. And if you, unless you train the model to have seen that, it won't know how to essentially do the, the reading of interest. We see the same issue in cervical cancer. So this is, again, data from two different uh, camera types and two different populations. When you train and test on the same, uh, as you see on the diagonal elements, you get really good performance, but on the off-diagonal elements, it's hardly better than chance. And again, when we looked at this uh, low dimensional representation, in this case, it was a T-SNE, um, which is another essentially low dimensional representation of the features as seen by the uh, trained network. What we see is each study or each camera type as color coded here is in a different space. So if you had originally, when we trained the model on the left images with the green and the red, we see we got uh, a, a model that worked well, but then now when we brought in these other camera types with the pink and the blues, uh, it's in a completely different space. And unless you retrain your model to be familiar with that sort of uh, image space, the model doesn't work well. The same sort of thing we see in ophthalmology in the ROP case. When you train and test on the same device, you get excellent performance. But when you train in one population and test on a different population, you can see a substantial drop in performance. So the sort of the immediate answer people say is there are wonderful data sets out there. There's DCIA, there's MIDRIC, there's many, many excellent central repositories of data, and they have been phenomenally useful in helping us train these models. So why not just put it all together and have these central databases? But obviously there's a lot of challenges with this, uh, data privacy being a huge one, getting images to be de-identified to the level where institutions are comfortable sharing them is, is very challenging, at least at the two institutions that I've been at. Uh, very, very often people want to sort of look at each image and make sure there's no burnt in PHI or other challenges like that. And that can get very expensive very soon. Uh, people don't are not comfortable with sort of sending the data out because although they may be comfortable doing it for a particular project, once the data is out there, it's out there and you cannot really control what people are gonna do with that. And moving large data sets around can be uh, quite challenging and cumbersome. So uh, going back to the previous, uh, issues, some ways in which we want to address this is by including increasing the data diversity by multi-institutional data sets. And uh, one way to do that is by federated learning. There are some new approaches uh, such as self-supervised learning that we think might be helpful uh, in making models more generalizable, but that is sort of brand new work that we are, uh, that the, the field is studying and maybe it will help mitigate some of these challenges. Uh, as we mentioned, models, we've seen a lot of uh, work around the bias in models. We've seen this many deep learning models being quite, uh, may not work as well in different populations. We've seen that in, uh, in dermatology. We saw that in pulse ox during uh, COVID, for instance. So we, the, the, for all of these uh, reasons, we need more diverse data sets. And as we would like, to get access to these data sets, we are continue to face the challenge of how do we do that in a way uh, that doesn't require necessarily moving all of the data around in a more privacy preserving manner. So federated learning is in, an approach that has been proposed to address some of these challenges. The idea with federated learning is you essentially have a way of learning a deep learning or other models in a distributed fashion. So the data doesn't leave the institutional firewalls or and it, it was originally sort of came about for a lot of a commercial, uh, sort of not, uh, more consumer uh, data like your phones, for instance. 
So federated learning is very often used in a, a variety of things that your phones do and do well, such as voice recognition and so on. So every time there's aggregation of these data sources from different people and models are trained on that. Uh, and it's typically accomplished using sort of technical approaches uh, such as weight averaging or gradient averaging. It can be synchronous or asynchronous. And there are many different ways to think about this notion of distributed learning. Uh, in the most sort of uh, taking a step back, the simplest approach would be model ensembling. So you train a model at each institution, you have now four or 10 or whatever number of models, and you ensemble the output predictions of each of these on your new data set. The second is federated learning, as we were just talking about, and I'll go into it in some more detail. Other flavors of that include cyclical weight transfer and split learning. All of these are sort of technical approaches that essentially get at the same core uh, need, which is we have data at, at multiple different institutions, and we would like to figure out how to learn from them this without necessarily moving the data around. In model ensembling, for instance, you essentially have multiple sites, models trained everywhere, and all of the models go into a central location. In the federal federated averaging case, essentially you have a, uh, you start off with a model, you initialize your task, each, in, each institution that is participating has local data, local annotations, the model gets pushed down to each institution. They do local training. The model, either the model weights or the gradients are sent back to the centralized parameter server. The model is aggregated. Essentially, very often, it's a very uh, straightforward way of doing the aggregation. And then an updated model is sent back down. And this process continues for a very long time until the model sort of converges. And essentially, you have a global model that works that may work well at each institution. In cyclical transfer, you start off in one place, you update your model, it goes to the central server, and you keep doing that till you, again, achieve uh, convergence. In split learning, you split the model between sort of your network, which is a set of uh, series of layers. You split it somewhere in the middle so that the, sub the central part of the network might be at the server, but the front and the back meaning the input and the labels are at each site. And we've shown that this approach can also work. There are some advantages to this in terms of potentially having some privacy preserving aspects that are quite advantages of this approach. So in all of these approaches, the idea again is that the data and the labels reside at each institution. There is a central server often, uh, not necessarily in the cyclical uh, case, but in the other cases you have a central server. The model is updated and sent to each uh, institution. So we took that uh, sort of philosophy and did a real world implementation of uh, breast density classification. There were seven institutions that participated in this. Uh, and the, the right away we noticed that the images look very different. So you have data from different institutions and you can see right away that the uh, detector types are different. The image types, in some cases, we had uh, 2D coming from Tomo data, the different in, uh, image resolutions, the way the DICOMs were uh, stored. So we had 12-bit data, 10-bit data, 14-bit data. Uh, the data set sizes were very different. And if you actually just looked at the data, you can see that it looks really different. Uh, and one of the challenges that uh, we were just discussing yesterday is that often when you're doing federated learning, you actually cannot see the data because all these data are behind institutional firewalls. So we, you don't really know uh, what the data look like unless you sort of figure out a way to at least get some aggregates and some numbers from these different uh, institutions. If you look at the histograms of the data from these seven uh, institutions, you see they look completely different. So right away, you might be you might appreciate the fact that if you had trained a model on client one and tried to apply it on client five, for instance, the model may not work at all because it looks very different. What was surprising to us is that the labels were different. Uh, we expect to have sort of a similar looking distribution of the different labels or at least uh, not so substantially different. And what we are sort of shocked to see is that one of the, the institutions does not use this class B at all, or almost at all. And in fact, they 
they had used it at one point and they completely stopped using it. So again, now if you think about training a model that has four classes and applying it to an institution that only has three classes, the model performance might not be quite, quite so good. Uh, so what we showed in this exercise is that A, it's possible to do it for real, and B, that the performance of the sort of central model that you get is better than many of the local models. And C, we did this uh, final step of doing fine tuning. So we have a global model, and then that gets pushed down to each site. And now we have one more round of fine tuning, and then we have seven sort of uh, fine tuned local models. So we have both a global model that works relatively well, but we also can personalize that model to each institution. Uh, we say, going back to the ROP case, again, the same uh, ROP diagnosis thing. What we did is a similar exercise in federated learning. We, so we had data as part of this consortium from uh, seven sites again. And in this case, uh, some sites had very small number of cases and would never have been able to uh, train a model because it's a rare disease. Uh, and they had relatively re uh, few positive cases. Uh, and so we showed that the Essentially, the model we were able to a do federated learning, and that the model performance was quite good. Uh, there were substantial differences in patient characteristics across these sites. Uh, these some were heavier babies, some were lighter babies. Disease pre prevalence was quite different, and some of this is true differences in disease prevalence, but some of them is difference in reading of the disease uh, disease properties. So, if you look at the uh, this is a model performance. If you had just trained local models, you can see that there can be substantial variability and very, we can have a site with very little data and has a fairly, not, not a very good model, but by doing federated learning, you can get to performance that's essentially non-distinguishable from uh, central performance. Uh, and some of that comes down to training data set size. You can see that some, some sites are very low, uh, data sets, and some sites had very low number of positive cases. So what we found from a more clinical perspective is that surprisingly to us, there was the proportion of uh, exams classified in different classes was substantially uh, different, which is not terribly surprising, but a quantity, quantitative measure of disease severity uh, that would have led to this sort of classes indicated that people were actually rating things differently across institution. So although the quantitative measure may be uh, saying this should be pre plus versus plus, that was not what the local labels were. The uh, So by using a federated learning, we were able to sort of uh, identify some of these differences and better understand how different sites are uh, labeling the data. And it provided a way of standardizing the clinical diagnosis. So even though we were using the local readings for the federated learning, what we ended up was essentially a model that performed as well as a consensus panel performance. Uh, the next thing I just wanted to touch upon was a uh, challenge that we conducted last year at Mikai, which is a, a big medical imaging conference to do uh, federated learning. So in this particular case, we were interested in actually inviting the participants to explore different ways of doing federated learning. So uh, there's lots and lots of questions about how we do that. Do we, what kind of norms do we use? What kind of aggregation do we use? How do we work, what's our workflow, all of that. So we essentially presented a um, infrastructure where we had the data set up as VMs, uh, virtual VMs, I mean, VMs in different um, instances. And so each instance had only data from a particular institution. Uh, there was a nice firewall that prevented the participants from actually seeing any data. All they could do is a submit a Docker that, that did the federated uh, uh, learning in whatever way they chose to. We provided an API that allowed them to interact with the data, but the, the participants could absolutely not see any of the data. They could submit the code, they could get the results, they could get results on the aggregate, they could get results on the test set, but they could actually not see any data at all. Um, so that, that was successful. We got people to participate and actually got better performance than what, than what we had had in the study that we did. 
so in order to facilitate federated learning, there are a number of uh, open source and non-open source frameworks. We've been working very closely with the Monai effort, which is a large uh, open source effort for medical image uh, computing for deep learning uh, and AI. Uh, there are many aspects to Monai, including a core, a, a deployment aspect, but they also have uh, a very nice uh, open source federated learning framework. Uh, and that can, we can sort of mix and match so that you can, there's the different NV flare, there's open FL, there's, there's a variety of different frameworks that can all mix and match with this, this Monai hub, for instance. Uh, so he, again, for people who are interested, I would, point you to some of these uh, open source resources. So what we hope is that federated learning can help us solve some of these uh, challenges which are related to data sharing across institutions. And the, the cost of creating central registries can be quite, quite significant. Uh, one has to make sure we have de-identified the, the, the level of de-identification and uh, that is required when you're putting your data out there is very high. And potentially with federated learning, we can show that a lot of this can be done in a privacy preserving manner in such a way uh, that we are not necessarily exposing any of the patient data. Uh, our goal is because now we can do this across many institutions across the globe. Uh, we are building more generalizable model. There was an effort uh, for brain tumor segmentation that it actually had data coming from like 80 different institutions. And so the goal is by exposing your model to a very large set of data sets that come from different scanner types from different places, uh, you might be able to build more generalizable uh, models. This is still a work in progress to see uh, how well these models do on a completely new unseen uh, data type, but th there's reason to uh, have some level of optimism there. In cases like ROP, which is a rare disease, when there may not be enough data at a single institution to build a model, having access to federated learning might help you build a model because that way you can get access to the, the, the data set sizes that you need to build these models. We see a lot of variability across institutions uh, and potentially again, federated learning can help sort of identify those cases and mitigate some of that. Uh, and going back to the bias issue, we really want to build our models on diverse data sets. There was a publication that said most of the models have been built with data coming from just three states in the US. Uh, and when we think now about global health and we want to build models across uh, across the globe, again, we, potentially there's ways to do that such a way that your model sees more data. There's a number of, number of technical considerations. So how do we do this? There's many different ways to do that. Do we want to do it synchronously or asynchronously? Often when we're doing it synchronously, if one site has uh, inadequate computing capability, for instance, it might be a weak link and that it might take a very long time. Uh, do we just do it and stop or do we keep doing it forever? I mean, your phones and things like that do it forever, but obviously with healthcare data, maybe we, we build a model and stop there. Uh, dealing with data heterogeneity, uh, Despite our best efforts, the final central model may not work as well at all, all institutions, and you may need to have local models uh, essentially to fine tune and personalize. Uh, this, if in a cyclical approach and other approaches, this notion of catastrophic forgetting, where the model learned uh, for the data it saw, it was fine tuned on a different data set, and now it forgot everything it knew about the original data set. Uh, in terms of log logistics, we need a consortium of billing participants. There needs to be agreement on what the clinical problem of interest is and how you're going to uh, annotate it. So are you going to have bounding boxes? Are you going to have classification on a study level? Are you going to have segmentation? Uh, how are you going to annotate the data? What architecture are we going to use? Uh, in A lot of this really sort of needs harmonization of labels, of data, of data and elements. And this interoperability efforts are really key and fundamental to being able to doing this successfully. We need infrastructure to enable secure communication between sites that involves often working with uh, hospital IT and not surprisingly, they're not often very excited about opening up fire, uh, ports to uh, the the world, right? So they they really don't like these breaches of uh, security. So there's 
definitely ways to do that, but it does require conversations with hospital IT to uh, make it work. And then uh, a really important topic is this notion of IP and publication. Before doing anything, I think it's important to say, okay, if we if this is a research project, how do we fairly assign value? How do we decide on publication strategy? Who's going to who's going to lead it? Who's going to be uh, uh, what's the authorship level? Often things like alphabetical works <laughs> works well or, or sort of creating a consortium works well, but I think those things are important to sort out before going too far. The same thing with IP. If, if the end of this, you're going to do something in terms of potentially commercialization, how do you think about value? So the questions we continue to grapple with is when the data are not identical, uh, sort of IID across institutions and you have differences in scanners, protocols, what's the best way to deal with that? Uh, how do we evaluate model performance? Do we want a model that works, like if you have different size data set, do we average the performance per, per site? Do we average it across all data? Uh, what, what should the test data look like? Uh, and, and a lot of these efforts, this question has come up before, we assume that our participants are well-meaning, uh, well but potentially incompetent. We are not assuming they are to be malicious. So if you, are, if you have to guard against sort of malicious uh, agents, we have to be, the, the bar can be potentially even higher in terms of the infrastructure needed for that. Uh, how do we incentivize participation? What are the true risks? There's been sort of both sides. Uh, so people have said, yes, maybe there's something you can do in terms of reconstructing based on the gradients that you are exchanging between sites. But a lot of the work has shown that those risks are actually in practice quite minimal. Uh, maybe the membership attack, meaning if you got a, if you had a data element, you might be able to say if it came from your training data or not, but without access to that entire training data set, as well as that element, it's really some of the risks are not, not as uh, high as people have worried about. At the same time, there is definitely a risk in that you're exchanging weights between sites. Uh, do, and, and then this question about, do we want a single global model? Do we want local models? What should we reflect local needs? Uh, is the best model that was trained in uh, Oregon, the best one that we want to use in India, or should people be allowed to use it, fine tune it to, uh, for sort of their local preferences? Uh, if you're going to the data valuation, meaning when you're talking about IP and say you want to say that everybody who gets, who contributes to the building of the model should get something out of it, how do you value that? Do you look at quantity? Do you look at quality, diversity? Uh, so that there's data-driven approaches to do that. There's also philosophical approaches to do that. So useful to think about before starting the project. So just uh, sort of to conclude, uh, machine learning AI is extremely data hungry. There's potential risks of bias in these models. And in order to develop robust, unbiased, fair, generalizable models, we really need access to lots of well-curated diverse data sets. And this diversity is in many different ways of uh, data types, of the disease geography, all of these things need to be in your data set. Uh, privacy preserving machine learning approaches such as federated learning uh, with encryption can be potentially one approach to get th getting there. It really does allow us to learn from multi-institutional multi data sets without the need for data sharing, but there's definitely uh, scientific, technical, and other logistical challenges. So with that, uh, thank you. I'm interested in a little bit digging into all the sources of systemic bias. I agree with you that um, you know that the algorithms are learning the the protocol, the camera before it's learning the pathology. And um, I, I, if we have, you know, I guess the questions are: Do we now need to have a tiering of models where maybe we have a model that's going to be uh, doing performing labels to say this 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 study? Uh, image doesn't have the right QA uh, or doesn't have the right image quality. And so then we can kind of exclude it from instead of putting it into our training models. And maybe, you know, is have you seen ways where we could say this image, regardless of what they say, is coming from this manufacturer and then potentially normalize it uh, across manufacturers? It, ha are you seeing that? Okay. There's a lot of uh, technical work that's happening in that space uh, as to how 
whether we have solved it is still a question. So uh, somebody had asked about self, uh, self-supervised self federated learning. That is definitely an approach that people are taking. So uh, if you have sort of infinite data where you train in a self-supervised way without labels, maybe you get to a place where um, you, you get a more generalizable model. But going back to your question about uh, sort of low quality data or low quality annotations, I think, Definitely, there are. When we go to deploy models, we often have to put in a quality assessment step first. So we want to make sure that the image on which we're doing inference is actually fit for inference, right? If, if you, I mean, if you feed in a picture of a cat, it'll happily tell you that cat has a, it is it's a tumor or not, right? I mean, these models tend to be so uh, brittle in terms of input validation that they'll give you an answer no matter what. They don't tend to have, I don't know, this is not my training data. I should be careful about making judgments on it. So I think at least for now, we tend to put in those as extra guardrails uh, to make sure that the we we measure something called a distribution difference. So uh, is this model out of distribution? Or is this image that we're doing inference on out of distribution or not? Or yes. does it come from a similar data set as was used for training? Uh, and in terms of looking at, I mean, potentially we look at the DICOM header and say, yes, this is this manufacturer. This is 12-bit uh, data, 14-bit data, and that can help normalize it. And going back to the question of um, people have used things like GANs to take a Siemens uh, MR image and make it look more like a GE, for instance. Does that improve the 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 score of the accuracy of the dice score of the segmentation algorithm when they do that? So when you train a model, so if you have a, a model, say, trained on manufacturer A, you take manufacturer B, uh, make it look like manufacturer A, and then run it, it does def- definitely improve the score. But that assumes that you have enough data to train this perfectly good GAN that can translate between types. So uh, what we still keep hoping is that we actually have an ability to fill in the gap. So when you look at those T-SNEs or UMAPs, you see these clusters. But we have we have not solved how to fill in the gaps there. And, and again, maybe self-supervision or something like that would be uh, a way that we can make, make some progress there. I'm wondering also maybe we can it, part of the might be how they're choosing negatives that are really not or, or the the controls the I feel that like a lot of it is going to be they're not doing propensity scoring in a good in a, in an advanced way that might be able to truly help us manage the bias better. If you take extreme examples of normals and disease, you get really good performance and this whole intermediate grayscale that people want to not think about it, unless you have a good representation of sort of all the spectrum of disease presentation, it, it can be very challenging to get something that works reliably. So. Katie has a question about the requirements for the FDA uh, for software as a medical device. Uh, I, I know we had the FDA came and gave a keynote last weekend, and they no longer accept uh, algorithms uh, uh, through their approval process from when it's coming from single source data. I believe the minimum requirement was four different sites because of this heterogeneity problem that they have. And I think it's interesting, you raised a lot of questions. Some of the questions I felt are tractable through governance, like we've seen author attribution and Odyssey, and the N3C has done a lot on governance that I thought would be really, that would be applicable for uh, for solving that. But neither of them solved the, how do we address the funding issue for, for doing a federated learning? So I don't know what, what your thoughts on or how, what kinds of funding mechanisms we should make the most sense for federated learning approaches. So we were fortunate to get a grant from NCI through the ITCR mechanism to do federated learning on um, a couple of different use cases, including brain tumor segmentation. We were also fortunate to get uh, funding through NEI to do federated learning on ROP. So the NIH is definitely uh, willing to fund federated learning proposals in my opinion, in my experience. Uh, but in terms of sort of scaling it up, it's it's uh, so that that can that can be a challenge, right? It's it it does require a lot of resources, both hardware, 
data curation um, expertise. And so, yeah, I think I think there's NIH is definitely funded, but I think there's definitely challenges to that. So I don't think there is yet a there's really is no existing evidence based imaging network that the FDA can but, leverage for testing its algorithms. Uh, is there a lower bound on the number of cases per site uh, that it, for participation? That's a good question. I don't know that we have a good sort of technical answer to that. Uh, it probably de depends on the uh, ease of the the question. So we've certainly found that uh, number of cases needed depends really on how easy the problem is in some ways. If it, the more complex it is, the more uh, the more cases you need. Uh, the but I think in our case, but in particular, it is not a terribly challenging problem. And uh, but having even a small representation from the per site was helpful. So most studies are 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 basically working on vapors. So most studies are a thousand studies, or if you look at all the centralized studies, they're very small data sets that are being used. Exactly. Where and the exactly. goal is with federated learning. Uh, Johns Hopkins does a million imaging studies per year. Uh, and so we know, so does University of Colorado. And so we should be able to have, the whole point of federated learning is to add some zeros onto the, the study size. Uh, I think it obviously always gets smaller when you start doing it by classification, by class, uh, that you might have, you know, you might get into to smaller numbers, but there's gotta be, yeah, if you, you've gotta be able to get to a certain number for it to be probably sufficient. And I think it's all the more important for some rare diseases, going back to the lower bound. I mean, I think like ROP, that we have seen that no institution, very few institutions have enough sample size to actually train a model. And so uh, there's a lot of value in collaborating with your friends across the country. So. Yes, uh, I think uh, we've seen how expensive it's been to centralize imaging uh, repositories, especially with potential de-identification of burned-in patient identifiers, like, as well as facial recognition with head CTs and head MRs, uh, requiring customized models for 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 stripping the, the the face of any identifiers, and so that's actually become. Uh, those are become very expensive processes to de-identify medical images, and then, uh, and then yeah. it really so yeah. uh, required two humans to look at every slice to make sure there's no PHI, which would be completely unaffordable. Like, I mean, who, who, which researcher can afford to pay for two researchers to look at every slice of an MR? It's just like, it's yeah, uh, very, very. Agreed. All right. So the next question we have is, uh, uh, are there any efforts for how we do learnability of these AI models? One, Because we know data shifts. Uh, we know scanners are always changing, adding new, doing stuff in, doing stuff into the guts of the image reconstruction. Uh, and so how, how do we, how do we make sure that if, we, as we work through federated learning, we can handle these distribution shifts? It's a really good question, and technically it's feasible. The question is, um, and maybe, Paul, you have better insight into what the FDA's current thinking on continual learning approaches, which they seemed open to in the past, is. Uh, so uh, from a technical perspective, I, mean, I mean, in the real world, this happens all the time. There's a continually learning model. You get feed more data, you get more things. Yeah, both the data... We can see both concepts, uh, concept uh, drifts as well as data drifts in the sense that association between findings and disease changed. And we saw that in COVID when uh, post-vaccination, you may be COVID positive, but your chest actually looks perfectly fine compared to pre-vaccination -pre kind of thing. Uh, and when your scanner changes something very, very subtle, suddenly a model breaks. So we absolutely need to have a measure of distribution differences that translates to performance and then decide if we need to update. And from a technical perspective, all of that is possible from a uh, FDA or other perspective, I'll defer to Paul. The two approaches, for, actually, you're making our case for us for why we need federated learning for a surveillance network for a known model 
um, that, that does segmentation that, that we can throw out there and all of a sudden it breaks on a new version of the same scanner when they updated the software, how are we going to be able to detect that? So this is something that actually there needs to be, the FDA is in charge. These are medical devices. CT scanners and MRs are medical devices. They have responsibility to say what they're doing is the same, but how do they prove that to the FDA? And the answer is you often need to have these real world surveillance tools to say, by the way, these common segmentation tools that uh, uh, that we that usually work all of a sudden fail for some reason because of changes made. The key here is understanding that imaging, medical imaging in particular, is not a calibrated instrument where you can put an, a phantom in it and get the same number each time. And so uh, I think that that's what's you know what's interesting is it, it is tied to uh, the radiologist reviewing in the cases. So but they may not. Uh, be looking at some of the same features that an AI algorithm might be using. And so I, uh, I just like that you're making the case for us for why we need to have a real world surveillance network to be able to track all the changes, because there's all kinds of changes that go on to the image processing of, of scanners as they try to improve the efficiency, uh, they imp improve the detector efficiency, they change uh, some of the imaging physics around the scanner. I was struck by the, this notion that the AI learns the protocol and learns the camera. Uh, and I think when it comes to federated learning in particular, because there are documentation issues with the clinical data, how do we, what, what would the equivalent, it seems to me that the equivalent would be that the AI can learn the documentation behavior of that institution. So I had it, had, what, what I think that's like that's absolutely right, yeah. I'm sorry? I'm sure that is correct. So, but what, what does that look like? How do you distinguish, how can you, can, can you separate out the, the um, documentation behavior signal from the biologic, biological signal? Really good question. I don't, so what we found is the documentation issue related to ROP, for instance. So where and how people put boundaries between diseases was very different. And what we were able to show is we, in learning this global consensus model, we can show that at this site, the, a score of three would be normal, but at that site, a score of four is not. I mean, the boundary between normal and abnormal is substantially different between different sites. And we could learn that by doing federated because we could actually learn to see what, how that those differences manifested in the the documentation, not, not documentation globally as you were referring to, but in a very sort of tiny piece of the documentation. So I, th I think if you trained a model to identify the source of the documentation and that model is successful, uh, it's gonna learn that first. Uh, these models uh, do something called shortcut learning, which is they like to learn the, the, the easiest uh, answer. And if the easiest answer is learning the differences between sites because of documentation, they'll learn that first. Uh, we we see, sort of see, saw that in COVID again. So uh, the model was learning prone versus supine based on the, uh, the markers and associating disease severity based on that. So it learned not that this, this person had, there's not looking at the, it was not looking at the chest, it was looking at the market to say, oh, this, is, this came from an inpatient versus an outpatient setting. So, uh, so these, given the chance, these models to learn shortcuts. And so the documentation could be a shortcut and it learned that first. And so we have to guard against that by really, uh, there's work that does in disentangling and tries to make it so that it does not, cannot know, uh, separate which the source data as well. Uh, and try to do that before doing the model, but it's a work in progress, I think. So. Federated learning, it doesn't mean we can't have local actors looking at false positives and false negatives. So I do feel like we're not doing, we don't necessarily need to do fully automated federated learning. And there's still things we, it's really important when, when we look at these models to see potentially false positives and false negatives because to see why it might be failing. Uh, but I, I do feel like it's going to create a new need for a lexicon for how we describe the data quality of the site. And so the last question exactly. is, how are you thinking about aggregation of these evaluation metrics? Also a really good question. And since we cannot share the data, we have to rely on the uh, whatever aggregate metrics that we get from the sites. And even doing that, this, uh, going back to the previous question about how many site, how many data elements you need from each site, when you're doing the aggregate, you want a model that aggregates 
first the site and then aggregates the site? Or do you want a model that aggregates all the individual values? Or how do we do it in a way that is gives equal value to what matters, which is do we give each site to have equal uh, vote in the <laughs> aggregation process? Or do we have each data point an equal vote or some some uh, or and that's where the data valuation piece comes. Maybe we want to value the minority classes more or the more rare um, uh, data elements more. So also a really good question. Many different ways to do it. No sort of fixed answer, I think. As, as, I, as you said, I have more questions than answers for everything. That's Let's... how science progresses. And what I like about the what I like about what you presented today is you presented technical questions. Technical questions are opportunities for us to address. Because you're right, we're not going to be able to move forward with where we need to have two radiologists to look at every image. We know that cost and we know that time delay. And yet, and so that's why we need to start. And we also know some of the limitations around having inter-observer variation. Uh, and so I do feel like it, what's exciting is this is a, gives us a whole new area for, for, for study to see how we can really bring together data at scale. What, what we've seen in radiology is I do feel like we're plateauing a bit uh, when it comes to the growth of AI and deep learning. We've seen, the it, it all started in 2012 with, you know, ImageNet, but we saw everyone started jumping on different architectures. It was a big architecture race for, you know, for a good uh, six or seven years. But I do feel like the architecture race is settling down quite a bit. And now we're struggling with uh, data heterogeneity is as, as one of the key issues to deal with. So Dr. Kapathy Kramer, thank you again for such a great discussion and uh, and presentation on, on ways that we can aggregate our data across our different health systems. Thank you so much for having me and hopefully we can do this for real. That's the plan. Uh, all right, everyone have a great day and uh, that concludes this session.